Just perhaps we've had some shocking insights into what really serious economic collapses do uh, to people's uh, lifestyles, their job opportunities, and all of those sorts of things. I mean, you've had the coronavirus as one example. We can now, if we're honest, see the one party state is hardly something we want to live under. Just perhaps to the obsession with climate change, I'm not saying it's not important, but I am saying the one track mind that had everybody so focused on it that they missed this train coming at us will sober us up a little bit and make us determined to rethink our own freedoms, rethink our own uh, uh, prosperity and uh, the desirability of being able to afford things and to think of our own children. It seems to me, though, that until we are willing to, to, to pull together and focus on our common interests and stop dividing over everything that divides us in the West, in our cultures, it's almost impossible to hope to find the sort of leaders, uh, you know, the good, strong people who can, uh, with high intelligence and with deep knowledge uh, and with deep courage, take us forward. We, we, we have to be worthy of them, if I can put it that way. There's a, in other words, we're being held back economically uh, by what we've allowed ourselves to become socially. Well, I think there's a very important lesson to be learned from this pandemic, uh, and, it, and it's not the one that the left wants us to learn, because the progressives uh, uh, here in the United States want to say, you see, this proves the case for big, big government. It proves the case uh, for some kind of uh, socialist uh, healthcare system, and, and, and it really doesn't do that at all, actually. Uh, what the pandemic has revealed is just how utterly defective big government is because we had big government set up to deal with pandemics, as I mentioned earlier, with its panoply of legislation, uh, task forces, uh, PowerPoint decks and 36 page reports, and it, it failed. Uh, it was the small, nimble government of Taiwan that that excelled. Uh, the other good performers, interestingly, in this crisis have included Israel. Uh, smallish states used to having very few friends in the international community have outperformed the big lumbering states uh, that uh, that I, I've talked about in our in our conversation. So, lesson number one: you need small technologically enabled smart government to contend with problems like pandemics and climate change. I like, I like you, John, I'm not saying climate change isn't an issue. It clearly is. And we're going to need to confront its, uh, its challenges with equal smartness. Because if we're as stupid about climate change as we've been about a pandemic, then we're going to crater our economy all over again the next time there are severe fires uh, or, or floods in some other part of, of, of the world. Um, so I, I think that's a really important uh, insight that the pandemic has, has given us. And I hope that we'll, we'll sit down and learn the right lessons from this, because I do see a future uh, for a slimmed down, uh, lighter, smarter kind of government uh, dealing with problems uh, of the sort that we're discussing in the way that I, I saw the Taiwanese doing. That there are some terrific things to be learned from that China uh, and some terrible uh, wrong things to be learned from its giant uh, one party dominated neighbor. But I, I do think that, that for the Australian government uh, as well as for the British and American governments, it's, it's important to see the need to reinvent the public sector in the 21st century so that it it isn't the incompetent failing bureaucratic big government that i'm afraid we've seen on display in, in both britain and the united states there are lots of countries that getting this right i could also have mentioned estonia one of the first countries to really be tech savvy about about government uh, and i'm i'm hoping that that this is an opportunity for us to take a long hard look in the mirror and say what has really not worked in our in our public sector? What what did we get wrong here, and how can we fix it? There is, I think, therefore, some basis for a new uh, individualistic, freedom-minded, uh, but technologically enabled democracy. I want to stress this because it's very important. We have to use technology in a whole variety of ways to ensure that our societies are safe, safe in this case from a contagious disease, 
we cannot let that lead to a big brother kind of surveillance state of the sort that they have in China. And what we can learn from a country like Taiwan is how you combine tech savviness with individual freedom and privacy. Uh, they really have done a good job there by bringing into the government uh, some of the kind of hacker libertarians that uh, are very much on the periphery of, of government in the United States. So yeah, I, I think there's some exciting possibilities uh, if we only know where to look for them. Uh, and the place to look for them is not Beijing, the place to look for them is actually Taipei. That's a very fascinating set of insights. Uh, uh, and. It's probably a truism of human nature that we've been prepared to give up some freedoms very quickly in terms of this lockdown out of concern and fear about our own well-being. Uh, fleeing for security and giving up some freedom when you don't feel safe is understandable, but we don't want to stay there. We have to move back to a commitment to freedom if we're to be worthy of, of either, I think. Um, but... Uh, can I just then conclude on something else that I think is very important? We need to be really careful not to overreact with the questions that are now being asked about globalisation. Uh, you know, free trade has lifted countless millions of people out of poverty around the world or freer trade. Uh, on the other hand, we have to have secure supply lines. I'm an Australian farmer. Uh, we produce a great deal of food for other people. Uh, the ratio is about one farmer for 600 people who eat, which, uh, in, in, which is quite extraordinary, I think. Um, uh, but uh, we can't do that without imported uh, uh, feedstock. Uh, we're dependent on imported oil, we're import uh, certain chemical ingredients, certain machinery parts we can't produce here anymore or don't produce, uh, a lot of our fertilisers, these sorts of things. So we've got to avoid extremes and overreactions as we hear calls for the re-establishment of manufacturing, the re-emergence of protectionism and so forth seems for me to be a real danger on the one hand. On the other hand, obviously you can't have a situation where America's dependent for 90% of its pharmaceuticals on Japan, Australia 80%. Getting that balance right, I think, will be very, very important for prosperity and for safety going forward. On China, not not Japan, John. I, I'm sure you you meant to say dependent on on China because I wouldn't be at all bothered if I, I, I were heavily reliant on on Japan, a, a democracy with very high standards of governance. Look, I I think that uh, one of the most important uh, developments, uh, really, of the last four years has been a, a fundamental shift in American attitudes towards China. Uh, Successive administrations essentially accommodated China's rise, acquiesced in its bending uh, of the rules of the World Trade Organization. And uh, for all his many flaws, Donald Trump uh, called time on that and changed the strategic direction of the United States. Uh, I'm a free trader. Uh, and uh, like you, I believe that there are enormous gains uh, to be had on all sides from a liberal international trading order. But we can't have the second largest economy in the world systematically breaking the rules and getting away with it. Uh, and that's really the, the, the situation that we've been in ever since China joined the WTO back in 2001. I think that the, a critical issue uh, that needs to be addressed in the wake of the pandemic is how far China is willing to play by the rules and how far we are prepared to trust it to do so. And after so many years, not just of intellectual property theft, but of systematic uh, cheating on subsidies to state-owned enterprises, the pursuit of, of a policy that is essentially one of self-sufficiency in semiconductors at the expense of, uh, of fair competition, all of that seems to me uh, still to be unresolved. And, and in a way, the pandemic got the Chinese off the hook because they just committed to a very limited phase one deal uh, with the United States. Um, now they haven't had to execute, they haven't had to deliver on that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of unfinished business to do on trade. There's a lot of unfinished business to do on a variety of other issues. Uh, one of those national champions that the Chinese have been subsidizing is Huawei. Uh, and Huawei was poised to become almost the uh, sole player, certainly the dominant player in 5G technology networks around the world. I'm glad to say that the pandemic has led at least one government, the British government, to rethink relying on, on Huawei. So I think there's a way forward 
uh, which doesn't lead us to the 1930s, doesn't lead us to a world of autarky and uh, extraordinarily high tariffs. Uh, there's a way forward, I think, also to uh, a meaningful free trade regime uh, for digital services. But there will have to be standards there that, that protect individuals from having their data exploited uh, by one party states and the companies that operate within those states. So I'm not entirely uh, uh, despairing. I, I think that we can fight for a, a liberal international order in trade, not only in goods, but also in, in services. But we will have to fight. It's not going to happen by itself. And it's certainly not going to happen if we simply take uh, China's uh, words at, at face value, because they've made many protestations of uh, of good faith on intellectual property and on other fronts, uh, but those have not been met by by actions, not been matched by actions any more than their their fine words about climate change have been matched by actions. They they ramp up coal consumption right now as part of their effort to get back uh, to economic normalcy. So I think in the wake of this crisis, it's not just the questions that I asked Xi Jinping that need to be answered. There's a whole range of questions that China needs to answer. And if it's not prepared to give honest answers and make meaningful commitments to a, a free trade order, then we will simply have to conclude uh, that it should leave the World Trade Organization or we should create a new organization of countries that are sincerely committed to economic freedom. That, that's my feeling. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.